At this point, we understand the difference between science and engineering. We know that science is the explanation of how things work and an explanation of the world's phenomenon. And we understand that engineering is the fulfilling of human needs and solving problems. So how does that work actually get done? How do scientists discover more about the world and how do engineers actually solve problems? Well, the answer to that question is through investigation. How does an investigation happen? Well, it's these five things right here. Questions, observations, hypotheses, theories, and laws. So in this video, we're going to define those terms with the hope that eventually will lay the foundation for you guys to develop your own investigations this year. The first step in any investigation is coming up with a good question that can kind of drive your research and drive your investigation. And I want to distinguish between scientific questions and non-scientific questions because scientific questions are going to help us develop a deeper understanding of the world, a deeper understanding of the phenomenon that's around us. And so a good question might be, why, does, why do hot air balloons float? Or why does a hot air balloon float? That's a great question. We could develop an investigation to explore that and collect data. It'd be fantastic. Whereas a non-scientific question is more of an opinion that just says, which hot air balloon is the prettiest? That's not going to really help us develop a deeper understanding of the world around us. Um, it might be a good conversation to have with friends, but it's not really a scientific question. So as we move forward this year, let's try to focus on developing those good scientific questions. After we make a good question, or sometimes even before we make a good question, we are going to make observations about the world around us. And observations are just, it's just evidence that we collect through our senses, through sight, through smell, through taste, through touch. So observations are evidence that we collect through our senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, all that. And you might look at the sky at night and just wonder, why does the moon change shape. You collect evidence. You make observations that some nights the moon is full and other nights it's not. Some nights it's a quarter moon, some nights it's a half moon, and those are your observations that you're making which lead you to ask questions and then maybe even make a hypothesis. I don't know. A baby makes tons of observations about the world around them. They're like putting everything in their mouth because they want to learn about everything around them. They don't understand anything. So they put snow in their mouth. They put, you know, toys in their mouth. My sister used to put flies in her mouth because she thought they were raisins. Oh my gosh. But the reason is because they're learning about the world. It's awesome. And that's why they need to play lots too. A geologist might look at the lava on a volcano and kind of analyze why it's thin or why it's thick. And over time, if they see sort of some patterns or something, they can maybe make predictions on what's going to happen with that volcano. I don't know. It's just the evidence that they collect, the observations they make. And then the world, if you were to look at the fossil record, you would notice that there are some fossils in Africa that are similar to those in South America. Same thing here in Australia. Fossils in Australia match with Antarctica. And those observations may lead you to kind of think, why is that the case? And it, it brings you, a, it kind of gives you a question. And so that question may then develop into a hypothesis, which is an educated guess. It's not just a blind guess. I mean, a hypothesis is an educated guess based on either prior knowledge or on some evidence, some pre-existing evidence. So a hypothesis is an educated guess based on evidence. It's not a blind guess. It's an educated guess. And then a hypothesis may turn into um, a theory along the way if enough evidence backs it up. So let's take a look at theories and then laws. Theories and hypotheses are similar but different in one aspect. A theory has much more evidence and observations to support it. By definition, a theory is a broad explanation that is widely accepted because it is supported by a great deal of evidence. A theory is a broad explanation that is widely accepted because it is supported by a great deal of evidence. To help you understand this better, let's take, it some take a look at some current theories in the scientific community. One of the most controversial topics in science deals with how animals came to be and how they developed on Earth. This question of how animals came to be, and even us, how we came to be, is a great scientific question and there's a plethora of evidence surrounding it, but the interpretation of this evidence is where scientists disagree. The theory of creation says that the world was created by a creator, God, according to the account laid out in the book of Genesis. One argument that supports the theory of creation is the fact that many animals have patterns and symmetry within their body structures. Take, for example, the butterfly here in this picture. If you were to count the dots on the right side of the wing and compare them to the left, and if you were to look at the patterns on the right side and compare them to the left, you would notice that they're symmetrical, that they match. 
You would also look at a human and say, well, a human has five fingers on each hand, five toes on each foot, two legs, two arms, and two eyes. Symmetry, beauty. If you were to look at a painting or photograph done by an artist that demonstrates symmetry and beauty, you would never doubt that somebody painted or designed it. Why? Why is that? Why do animals look like this? Well, the theory of creation says that those symmet symmetrical patterns and beauty is an evidence of is evidence for a creator. On the contrary, the theory of evolution looks at the evidence a little differently. Evolution would not only interpret those patterns differently, it would also make some different arguments about the development of life. Take a look at these pictures on the bottom. An ape, though different than a human, has some similarities in body structure, intelligence, and DNA. And the same holds true for fish and lizards. Fish look similar to lizards in many ways besides the fact that they have no legs. And since they have similarities, the theory of evolution presumes that these species are relatives to each other. So apes are relatives of humans, and fish are relatives of lizards and such. Though both of these theories are accepted within the scientific community, they're generally exclusive, meaning that scientists believe in one or the other. The interesting thing about theories is that as new evidence and new technology comes out, they can change. So, for example, caloric theory used to be a theory that people believed concerning how heat was transferred. If you sat next to a fire in like the year 1700 or something, you may have believed that this substance caloric was flowing out of the fire. It was this invisible gas that flowed out of the fire and flowed into you, and that's what caused you to warm up, and that's how heat was transferred. That was their theory, but now, you know, as new technology came out and as we, uh, you know, gathered new evidence about heat transfer, we now understand that heat is transferred three ways through radiation, conduction, and convection, which we'll learn about a little bit later this year. The theory of continental drift is a theory that talks about or explains how continents move, meaning that they're floating on a bed of magma and that every couple year or every year they move like a couple centimeters. And so that theory may change. I mean, as new evidence comes out, if we somehow develop the technology to actually travel to the center of the earth, maybe we'll actually be able to understand that theory a little bit more, understand that phenomenon a little bit more, and that theory may be updated. We'll see kind of the fun of science. Now, laws are a little bit different than theories. Laws explain what happens. Theories explain like why and how something happens, whereas a law explains something that happens seems to be true all the time. They explain what happens. So theories are more like the why and the how, whereas laws are explaining something that seems to be true all the time or the what, what happens. And two examples of that are the law of gravitation and the second law of thermodynamics. Law of gravitation simply says that, you know, when you drop an object, it's going to fall. And that's just something that seems to be true all the time. It's a law. The second law of thermodynamics says that the world is in a constant state of entropy, meaning that it's in a constant state of chaos or that things do not become more organized, they become more disorganized. So if I were to take this car right here and just let it sit there for a thousand years, what's going to happen to it? it's probably going to turn into a rust bucket because that's what the world does. It does not get more organized. It's probably not going to turn into, you know, a Lamborghini or something like that, but it's probably going to turn into a rust bucket. And that's why it's a, a law because it's something that seems to be true all the time.